Howdy again, it's Tubal Kane, and this is part two of uh, my What Makes It Work number 23 series, and it's entitled uh, Resistance Spot Welder. If you watched part one, it was just a brief overview of a spot welder, a resistance welder, and how it works and what it does, but I'm going to carry it just a little bit farther if you're interested in this type uh, of uh, video or this type of machine here to show you how to maintain a uh, the tips and all of that and again how how this thing works and remember just to repeat from the last video it's a matter of squeezing welding with the current on holding during the forge and then pressure off and that's what the whole thing is low voltage high current no resistance here on the machine very high resistance on steel. Did you know, a bit of trivia here for you, worthless trivia if you will, that Appleton, Wisconsin, the home of Miller Welding, Miller Electric, is also the boyhood home of Harry Houdini, the world's greatest magician. Over the years I had several spot welders at the high school and at one time I had this exact model with the old vacuum tube timer and then later I had one with a uh, solid state timer but it was uh, the welder looked identical to this but you really have to experiment with these welders with some scrap stock to determine the setting that you need for a given job so that kind of goes along with the territory and be very careful not to press down on the handles and the switch when the machine is on because you can weld the tips together and okay let's take a look at the control end of this little welder and this is the switch on and off switch and the timer so when I turn it on you see the pilot light come on and there are two vacuum tubes in there I thought I could show them to you from the end and that they uh, were glowing but I, 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 they don't show up so uh, you can make your settings here whatever you want and you need to practice on some scrap metal to determine what the setting needs to be for the thicknesses that uh, you are welding so I'm not going to say too much more about that other than this is a low setting and as you go it gets it's longer and longer and longer because it is a timer on the top of the welder we have the lever here and I think that's a first class lever so that allows you to put quite a bit of pressure onto the tips and when this comes all the way down the pressure is maximum and also uh, activates the little micro switch on the top here which starts the timer cycle if you have a harbor freight it's not going to have this and you just have to guess at the amount of time that you're holding it down and that would also be by practice on scrap now at the moment, to, to demonstrate this, I'm going to put some wood between the tips here so I don't burn them together. And I must say that high school kids love to weld the tips together. So I think you can hear this now. So when I push the micro switch down, I'm making a sample setting here. That's a rather short weld. That would be for something very, very thin. And as I increase the setting, you can hear that the weld time is longer and so on you can hear it go on and off this welder is quite heavy and it can be carried around and uh, used in a manner like this Re taken to the work rather than the work taken to the machine but I, and I have the machine turned off right now that timer is turned off but right here we have our pressure uh, adjustment so right now I have relaxed it so there really is no pressure at all so you need to set that pressure for whatever uh, metal that you are welding and in this case two pieces of uh, 22 gauge and I'll use this those are all welded already welded together to adjust this screwing it in a little bit now until I feel tension and you don't want too much pressure if you got too much pressure you're literally going to blow the the uh, metal apart as the weld proceeds and the metal turns red hot 
and then it can be locked. There's a double nut here. And if you're going to do a lot of uh, one particular uh, job, and in the high school level, normally I would have that preset for the kids so that they didn't destroy their work because sometimes they'd be working on a sheet metal project and they would ruin it by having this set too high. They'd blow a hole through it. They would also love to sabotage the work of others and set this real high. So you had to be watching for that as a shop teacher, unfortunately. Unplug your welder when you're making settings. You should do that with any power machine, as you know. I'm going to take the tongs out just to show you how they're made. And they're quite expensive. You can get them in different lengths and all kinds of funny offsets for whatever job you may uh, need to perform them. And there's also a screw for the lower one. And now you can see these will pull out. And they need to be kept bright here for a good connection. And there is the tip and they screw and thread into the tongs and look something like this. Matter of fact, they look exactly like this. And there's the old uh, Miller package from a long time ago. And I had a laugh. But long before Ziploc bags, they had plastic bags with a drawstring. Boy, that's old. And then also in the bag came this uh, little tablets of this uh, compound, whatever it is, that can be put on the thread to keep the tips from galling and sticking. And I've had, I've ruined uh, tongs where I had to buy new ones at the school because uh, when, when you went to get these out, you couldn't get them out and it just tore the thread up. But let me take that out right now. Let me take this tip out right now on this tong rather than the other one because it's, and there's flat spots here. Where are they? Someplace. It allowed you to put a wrench on it. Now I had uh, just installed these a little while ago and I had just for this demonstration. So those have only been used a couple times. You can see them starting to uh, discolor because they'll soon turn dark. Now the tip, let me take a brand new one here from the factory should be on this particular one about 530 seconds in diameter at the end. Eventually they'll get flatter and, and larger in diameter with use and uh, that would change your setting and the appearance of your weld and all of that so you want to keep them about that size and since these are relatively expensive I recondition them and I think I'm going to do one for you right now and show you how I do it to to flatten them out again and that also can be done with a file but also to reduce them and this is an included angle I believe of 40 degrees so I'll set the compound on the lathe for 20 and do one real quickly for you. I'm going to recondition this tip it's not real bad but since there are flats on here they have to be held in a collet so here's a 5 8 collet in my little hard hardened lathe, let me go ahead and tighten that and install it and, and turn it down for you. Okay, the tip is in the collet. I notice that the compound is set at 20 degrees. And all I do is turn the machine on. First I face it. I take off as little as possible, just enough to square the tip up. You could file this as well, but it just, it just would be freehand and probably not that accurate. So I didn't take off much, and then I just proceed to take a light cut, and I'm just doing it taper turning here by the compound method is all I'm doing. All the way as far as I can without hitting the collet. And probably take several passes until I get the tip exactly 530 seconds in diameter and I'll just compare it with uh, the factory one or I could bring that little gauge over that you saw earlier. And there's the reconditioned one. It will always have that step on it and you can do that several times before you run out of material and have to discard it. 
And now I'll put just a little bit of this material, and I'm not sure what it is as it comes with the tips from Miller. Some kind of anti-seize is what it is. It's kind of gooey and messy, and then I will screw that back in. Snug it down. Same thing with the other one. I cleaned this thread up just a little bit with a tap because I didn't like the way that tip felt when I took it out. 3 8 fine, that's 3 8 24, and I cannot emphasize strongly enough how important this uh, gooey compound is on the thread. See how gooey that is? I guess it doesn't matter whether you put it in here or, or onto the tip, as long as you get some on there. And I don't know if other welders are built the same as this. I really don't. That's a, a used tip that I put on. I just thought of something I haven't thought about in 40 years, or 30 years, let's say. In the school shop, when the kids would load it up with zinc, with galvanized, or, or just ruin the tip, sometimes to expedite matters, when I had 24 kids chomping at the bit, I would put a file in there, with the machine turned off and just gently file that and that would square it up a bit and uh, and recondition the tips to some extent but you had to be careful to keep the uh, file level and perpendicular to the axis and all that good stuff or you would cause more damage than uh, what you were uh, correcting but the, they also made I believe a tip restorer that you you put in there and it had a, a handle on it, and it was kind of like a double-pointed pencil sharpener, the cheap kind that, that kids would get for a nickel and use in school, you know. It would be like that on two ends, put it in there, and turn that back and forth, and uh, it must have been a filing action. I did, never, never did have one, but I recall seeing that somewhere. So that, that's another alternative to uh, conditioning the tips, reconditioning the tips. That's free of charge. Looking at the machine from this angle, it's really important that these two tongs, and therefore the two tips, meet with each other perfectly in alignment and perpendicular and so on before you tighten the screw. And then similarly from uh, this side, that they be in alignment in this direction, the X direction or the Y or whatever it is. And that, uh, you don't need to check that all the time. That's probably not going to change on you. And I'll go ahead and tighten that up off camera. As I mentioned earlier, the spot welder tongs are available in many different sizes. This is taken right off the internet. Shapes and configurations. Now Miller didn't sell all of these, but they did have a selection of them at one time in their catalog. I don't know if they still do allowed you to get into different kinds of work. Let me reiterate, if I may. Oh, and by the way, there's always somebody who says, you do too much off camera. Well, I try to explain things, that's why. Th this uh, steel had a bit of rust on it on one side and had paint on the other. I told you I ground it off and that you're not going to have any luck with uh, galvanized metal. That, that's always a problem. It loads the tip, so avoid galvanized unless you're willing to grind off the zinc, and you're not. Painted repair items, you got to take the paint off. The kids would bring in fenders off of bicycles and things like that, and they didn't want to take the paint off. Well, that insulates it. It doesn't work. You cannot uh, spot weld aluminum, and uh, I can't tell you how many spatulas and other little devices from McDonald's and other fast food that we repaired over the years. And then the kids would always bring me from the manager one of those uh, be our guest passes so I get a free sandwich or something. It's about all the pay I got for all those years for the repair jobs too, I might say. And there were thousands of them. So uh, that's the kind of metal that you can weld and will be able to weld successfully. And as far as the thickness is concerned, again, that depends on the capacity of the machine. And this one, I think in the catalog, said that it will 
go up to 16 gauge, but I think that was really pushing it. I'm having a heck of a time finding sheet metal around my shop that is thin, and I finally took a piece of a tin can, and believe it or not, that's 36 gauge, I believe it is, which is the smallest slot on that gauge. And you know, these cans are always coated with something, so I, I had to scrape that off, but I'll go ahead and see if I can weld this. And by the way, I, when I was looking for cans, and this one didn't work out, that was too hard to cut, but there is a resistance weld. A butt weld, not a spot weld, but a re nevertheless a resistance weld. And you see those on cans. That's a different way than they made them, let's say, 40 years ago, where they kind of had a finger lap. Remember some of those? I had to scrape that paint off. That's tin plate, by the way. Tin plated steel. I hope the paint is off enough to where it'll weld. And this is set at a real low setting. Let's see how this welds. Hmm. Stuck to the tip a little bit. Looks pretty good. I'm not going to try to break, it's still hot, try to break that and cut myself on these jagged edges, but I just wanted to show you a weld on something relatively thin. Let me do a destructive test on this spot weld here. This is the tin can. See if I can twist it off. I did, and to me this tells me that it was an excellent weld because it tore the metal out of that piece and left the nugget in that piece. So the setting I would say was perfect for this thickness of metal. Now I will try to tear this weld apart on the thicker metal which is going to be more difficult. I gotta get some more tools. Finally! And on this one also it ripped a hole in it. Now that probably won't happen if I twist it like I did in the one other sample. This is more a matter of tearing and there's the weld nugget left on there. In other words, probably can break a single one by twisting or shearing where this, I peeled it off to show how strong the weld was. I'm glad I did that and I hope that interested you. I know this is getting long, but you're with me because you want it long. The other people left me after part one, so we'll see who, how many watch part one compared to part two. So I, I, that helps me judge on how much material I should present, but here's the thicker metal. Again, sometimes those sparks really fly, so wear your safety glasses or a shield. This was kind of dangerous in the school because there'd be other kids working on the bench doing other things uh, uh, and, and the sparks would fly in their direction so I had to kind of isolate it in an area where they, that wouldn't happen. Still seems to be sticking onto the tips just a little bit. Now those, that would be very very strong weld. Well that concludes part two of uh, what makes it work on a spot welder. I hope you liked it. Leave a comment if you liked it. Uh, say nothing if you didn't. Thanks for watching. It's Tubal Kane. I'll see you in the next video.